The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, as chair of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, I call this meeting to order. My name is Steve Judge, and I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and Governor's March 15th, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this public hearing of the Town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on the link on the town's webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the regular members of the ZBA who have been impaneled for consideration of the item on tonight's agenda. I'm Steve Judge. Mr. Langsdale, are you here? I'm here. Ms. O'Meara? Here. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Ms. Waldman? I'm here. Mr. Barrick? Mr. Greeny, Mr. Meadows. We have four in attendance. That's a quorum for purposes of uh, uh, receiving uh, testimony and, and we expect Mr. Dillon uh, Maxfield will um, be on in a second. Also in attendance is Maureen Pollock, uh, a planner with the town, Dave Washevitz uh, with the building inspectors department. I think Mr. Mora was also, is also here and John Witten of the law firm of KP law firm who is serving as outside counsel to the board on this matter. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. Each petition is heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits. And the board is not ruled by precedent. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board may seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raise hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. And I want to remind the applicant, my fellow board members, and the public to seek recognition from the chair before speaking. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each application. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. The following is a statutory timeline for ZBA action on a comprehensive permit. Within 40 days from closing of the public hearing, the ZBA must render a decision, denial, approval, or approval with conditions based on a majority vote. Within 14 days of its decisions, the ZBA must file a copy with the town clerk. And with 20 days from the, from, from the date of the ZBA decision is filed with the town clerk, the public can appeal the ZBA's decision. In addition, I just want to review the ways the public can be informed about and comment on this application, in addition to these public meetings. Residents can sign up to be notified of any additional information recorded by the town concerning this application through the Notify Me feature on the town website. Copies of all submissions can be found on the town website. Go to the ZBA page, click on the link for 132 Northampton Road. That link will bring you to a page which allows you to navigate to all the public information regarding this application. Public comments can be submitted on the 132 Northampton Road page or by emailing to Maureen Pollock Planner at P-O-L-L 
O-C-K-M, at amherstma.gov. Amherst Media will not be broadcasting tonight's hearing live. However, check their website for information or on when it will be rebroadcast or if you can, or you can view a recording of this meeting on the town's YouTube channel. Uh, before we proceed, I note that Mr. Maxfield is here, so we'll mark him as present. Tonight's meeting agenda is as follows. A public hearing to consider ZBA 2020-39, Valley Community Development Corporation, 132 Northampton Road, request a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct a new two and a half story residential multifamily building containing 28 small studio apartments and related common areas on an approximate 0.88 acre property located at 132 Northampton Road, map 14C, parcel eight, general residence RG and educational ED zoning district. This meeting, this public hearing is continued from September 24th, 2020. Items on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Responses to questions from the board at the September 24th public hearing. Review and discussion of waiver re requests. Public comment regarding waiver requests. Discussion of possible questions, requests, and conditions among board members. And other items de uh, deemed appropriate. We will also have a general comment period as we do every meeting on matters that are not before the board tonight and any other business not anticipated within 48 hours. We have a full agenda tonight and I intend to provide time for public comment. The board has a 21 page memo reviewing the waiver request, which we received earlier today. Board members have not had the time to review this memo prior to tonight's meeting. We're not going to vote to approve or deny these waiver requests tonight. Rather tonight is an opportunity to review and discuss these waiver requests and to get input from the applicant town staff and the public. We will dispose of these waiver requests at the next public meeting. Since the September 24th public hearing, the board has received the following submissions. A PowerPoint presentation from the applicant responding to questions from the board, from the board at our last meeting. Amherst's historical commission, uh, a letter from Amherst's historic commission saying they voted to support the demolition of the structure on 132 Northampton, and further did not believe that a de demo demolition delay was warranted. And we received six public comments between September 24th and October 7th. Those public comments were an anonymous public comment submitted to the town via the town website dated September 24th. Kate Trost comment submitted via email dated September 28th. Anonymous comment submitted town website dated October 6th. Hillary Wilbur, comment submitted via email dated October 6th. Barbara Graven Wilbur, comment submitted via email dated October 6th. And Rebecca Frick, comment submitted via email dated October 7th. The first item on the agenda is the answers to the questions we asked of the applicant at our September 24th meeting. Ms. Baker, are you representing the Community Valley Development Corporation tonight? Yes, I will be. Uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager for Valley Community Development Corporation. We're located at 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton. Great. Uh, I know we've got a um, PowerPoint presentation from you. Can you um, discuss you. that? We'll deal with each of the two questions individually. Okay. okay, I'm hoping you can see this uh, first page. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Um, so we had a lot of discussion at the last meeting about various locations, possible locations for a smoking area. Uh, we were asked to further explore two potential sites, uh, a modification of the original location, which we're calling option A, and a possible new location, which we're calling option G. And I'm gonna actually ask Rachel, who I see is here, to maybe go through a bit of the details related to these two potential locations. 
Sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, so per after last CBA's discussion, we looked at- oh, Ms. Loffler, just again, we just need you to um, identify yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, Rachel Leffler of Berkshire Design Group of Northampton. Um, Thank you. Okay. So after the last CBA meeting, we, um, we heard input that the previous location A, which is nearby where we're calling Alt A, um, would be more acceptable if it were closer to the property line and further away from the building. Um, so we looked at what that would entail and that does require a little bit more grading and a slight retaining wall, a two foot retaining wall for the smoking area. Um, that area is shown in red. Um, so it's moved closer to the property line. Um, and then additionally in that option, we explored removing the garden beds, which were on the west side of the building and moving that to the, to the north side of the building, which are the little square um, and orangish red on the plan to the right of the building. Um, and also we moved the patio area three feet to the, to the south, to, again, to get it a little bit further away from Alt, Alt A. Um, that area would have, an, would have a smoking pavilion as we previously proposed with a bench and an asher. And then we also heard feedback that um, it was desired to look at a possible location closer to Northampton Road further away from the building um, with maybe not a shelter cover, but a, a bench and some sort of screening with vegetation. Um, it's really tight over there in terms of grading and drainage, but we've carved out a little of a space um, for that bench. So that would be a bench with a bit of a, a fence behind it, a low fence, uh, a four foot high fence and some shrubs behind that also. That also would have a smoking urn for uh, removal of the cigarette waste um, and some evergreen shrubs for screening. So we can see, um, just chiming in a little bit, that the Alt A option is now 25 feet from the building, which was something that was important to folks. Um, and the Alt G is set back just far enough to pull it out of the front um, setback. Um, it's 88, 86 feet away from the building face. Um, people may recall we were a little sensitive about this area in front of the building because it does have the intake um, for the fresh air system. So I, I'm hoping tonight we decide on a location or to make this a smoke-free property, which we had offered and I know some public comments um, that came in related to that. Um, and then we could depending on which location or is selected, we could provide additional, say if it was this location, we could provide additional images of what this might look like. Are there comments regarding the two proposed locations for a smoking area? Mr. Maxfield. I guess this is a, a question for, for you, Mr. Chair, which would be, yep. uh, do we want to take some type of vote on whether or not we want it to be A or G tonight as a board and then can move forward with conditions about that later or even say the selected location versus no smoking later if we want to do that just so we can kind of kind of be done with this this location area how, uh, you know the this? goal would be not to have an, a formal vote but to give it a, a sense of the board and then we would do it when we do conditions at a later point. But I think we could, we have to answer all three questions and we probably ought to do it. But number one, should it be a smoke free and that eliminates the need for a vote on Alt A and G. Um, yeah, Alt A and Alt G. Uh, and then if we, if that doesn't pass, if that isn't the consensus of the board to have it non-smoking, then we try to give the applicant, uh, we do give the applicant a, a idea of where we both, what we as a board would support and they could go then and move on and we will vote on that when we vote on conditions. So I'd like to give them some kind of consensus, something to, to move forward on tonight and not discuss this any, at any length in the future. Go ahead. Yes, Mr. Maxfield. And then, yeah, my follow up on that is yet at this point currently I, I'm in support of uh, Alt A's location. Um, any other comments from board members regarding Alt A, Alt G, or it being a non-smoking site. Ms. Parks. 
Um, I'm just wondering, um, you were saying for Alt-G that you may have some kind of images of what that might look like. It, do you have that in this presentation? Uh, no, we do not. Okay. We, would, we were kind of thinking of a, a softer approach. Uh, we didn't really want to put a big structure right in the front yard. It felt a little inconsistent with our goal of having a traditional style building. So we were looking at, it's described here a bit, you know, a trellis, a basically a corner trellis fence with some vines on it, with maybe two chairs or a bench, just something that looked more like it belongs in a front yard, um, but it might not have a, a full rain cover over it. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't wanna dig really deep into images until people decided what was their preferred location. And, um, Ms. Parks? Yeah, I don't know if I, how to ask this correctly, but for the other properties that you manage, what, how, are, are any of them non-smoking and how has that, has that worked out? Yeah, so many of them are non-smoking. Um, um, I, I, I know I've referenced the Sergeant House because it just opened in Northampton. Initially, it was a non-smoking property and building. Um, it's very tight to its neighbors. We had complaints from neighbors that people were smoking in front of their house. Um, and so the solution was to set up a designated smoking area on our own property. Um, it's not 25 feet from the building and it was very close to the sidewalk. I showed an image of it. It's just a bench. There's no cover over it. Um, but it seems to be working effectively um, as, you know, kind of just showing people where that behavior is going to happen um, and controlling it in that way. People don't seem to mind if they have to use an umbrella or anything like that. Okay. So it's, it's not like a, we don't want to have something that looks like a bus shelter, you know, kind of in the front yard. Right, I, I get, I, I, you answered what I was thinking of, which is um, if people are going to smoke, they're, they're probably going to smoke. And so, it, yeah, there's, to, there's, to my mind, it's better to have a place to smoke than having people either smoke in the units and not say anything or smoke in places you don't want them to be. Yeah, there's, there's some evidence that, that making it, putting up barriers for people to smoke, it does act as a deterrent, but I don't think it's quite that simple. I think people have to be ready to cut back or quit before that's really going to happen. But then every time they raise the price of cigarettes, every time it becomes harder to smoke in different places, all those things act as subtle kind of deterrents to people. Okay. Ms. Lequa? I would just add quickly um, that as the no smoking rules uh, evolved and became um, rules applied to properties, there was definitely an evolution. Um, and we're talking back, you know, 15 years ago, this was starting, you know, optionally and whatnot. And there's just been an evolution in recognizing that the indoor air quality and the health concerns of neighbors were really what was trying to be eliminated by making properties go no smoking. And the first compliance issues were there. And residents who have kids with asthma or any other concerns about indoor air quality, that was where the compliance and lease enforcement happened. And Laura is very right that you can't force people to stop smoking. Sometimes they do when these rules happen and they don't, or they start to vape and you can vape inside your house. It's not that it doesn't cause the same problem. So it does cause some changes in behaviors in my experience working in my portfolios, but it is also true that those who will not quit um, having a pleasant place for them to sit and talk to each other while I have a cigarette works. Um. As far as my my thoughts, I like Alt A just because I I don't like the fact of putting people out on on Northampton Road to smoke and then walk in. I think it's I, I think it's stigmatizing and I don't think it gives the um, I don't think it's consistent with the neighborhood feel. I think other structures on Northampton don't have would not have a similar situation where people would be smoking up close to the road. Um, they would be in their backyard or on the deck or someplace else. I think Alt A seems to me to be far enough away from the building to um, not cause problems with the air intake. It's also bordering on a parking lot that is, that I think is not used on a regular basis. Whenever I go past it, there are not a lot of cars parked there, perhaps on a Saturday afternoon when there's a game or some other function. 
at the school, but I don't see that it's a crowded parking lot. And I think this gives a lot of um, a lot of air for for the, around the the park the smoking area for the smoke to dispense disperse and not create problems for people. So my inclination is all day, um, and I I don't think it's I mean it's up to you, but I don't think that it's reasonable or realistic to have a non-smoking property because I think people will will find a way to smoke. Um, is there any other comments, Mr. Langsdale? Um, <clears throat> I have a. a couple of questions. Uh, Alt A now is five feet from the property line. And on the other side of the fence that's along there, there is uh, some grassy area and then the parking area. Um, and the parking area extends all the way uh, the length of your property um, on the other side of the fence, of course. Um, have you, has there been any discussion with uh, Amherst College about this, about the location of this? Yeah, very, very informally, there was early discussion. And it was my question to them about, you know, without some kind of guidance and, and rulemaking by us, people would probably use this back patio to smoke. Um, and their preference was to move that further from the track. And so their, their suggestion was to shift it this way toward Northampton Road. The, the patio, you mean? Nope, the smoking. Oh, the smoking area. Yeah. Um, so have they, have they seen this? This, this, this one that you're seeing tonight? Yeah. They, have, they, they saw the original plan, which okay. um, had, you know, it's, I think it was, maybe eight feet from the property line instead of five feet. I don't know if you remember, Rachel, but the concept. Well, it, it, be, it, was, it was 11 feet from the building and now it's 25 feet. So that's a difference of 14 feet. So it couldn't have been eight feet from the property line. It had, it was on the other side of the, uh, the pathway. Yep. Um, so it was more than certainly yep. more than it is more like 15 feet from the property. So I send them routine updates, but I do not send them every time we tinker sure. with the plan. I don't sure. send it. But they did see the original plan with the original smoking area. Um, and they did not make any negative comments about where it was located. Okay. Um, my alternative, uh, my, my preference would be uh, uh, G. Um, because I think the A is, for one thing, it's a pavilion, which will house more people. Uh, also, uh, it would house people during <laughs> snow and rain, and it, it might uh, engender more smoking than G, which is only one bench. And it's very, it's 86 feet from the building, which uh, would not have an impact on the intake. And it's over, it would be well over a hundred feet, right? From the, from the uh, neighbor to yeah. the, to the east uh, and 15 feet from the property line. And then the um, sidewalk and then the road and uh, it would be, significantly far enough away from the neighbors on the other side of the road that it, I don't think it would be a problem. Um, plus you've done, I think very well with putting the, the fence and the, uh, the shrubs around it. Um, I just think it, it, it isolates it more. And I think that's, that's better for the, everyone in the building. Um, and uh, better than the, alternate A, which is a lot closer to the parking area. The other question I have though is, if you were, uh, if, if you were to, let's say, do alternate G and put that there, would, is, would, will there be anything in, I guess, the, the lease agreement that stipulates where that smoking area is, that that's the only place that smoking can occur and what kind of, what ways you might have to enforce that and um, any um, uh, possible 
uh, uh, outcomes if people disregard that and smoke in other areas? Sure. So like any other type of house rules or lease requirements, um, that would appear in the lease that you can only smoke in XYZ area or this is a non-smoking property, you can't smoke on it at all. Right. Um, like any lease violation, there are usually protocols in place. You know, there might be a warning at first, there might be a second warning, there might be a written warning. Um, I, I don't know, Jane, you may know this better than I do, whether um, landlords have had success evicting tenants for legal behavior like smoking. Um, it's a tricky issue. I yeah. think it is um, what we saw at Sargent House was there was actually peer pressure. Like people were really grateful to have the housing. They didn't want to muck it up and they policed each other. Like they didn't want problems with the neighbors. They, they just didn't want problems. They didn't want to be kicked out. They, they didn't want to be seen as a troubled property. And so they kind of kept on an, an eye on each other. Does it mean no one will ever violate the lease? Of course not. People do. But um, we find that there's a pretty good self self patrolling system. And I would add, um, oh, may I speak, Mr. Chairman, real yep. quick? Okay. Yes, I would just add, Laura, I, I agree uh, with everything Laura just said. I think Mr. Langsdale's question does go to the processes we've brought up in um, these meetings along other lines as well, where property management will enforce the lease um, and the house rules and policies. And it will typically be someone who is chronically um, breaking those rules. And landlords, we, we do win those cases. If, if residents are not complying with the lease and they're doing so over and over again, but as Laura pointed out, you know, there would be a conversation, there would be a warning, there would be a process before we ever got there. Um, and I also really agree with her that um, neighbors are a big part of the process. Neighbors make it uncomfortable for you to break the rules. And those are the neighbors and residents we like because um, they, they help us with our community, so. So well, it seems to me we're coming close to a consensus on this. And I'd like to, to indicate that through polling rather than a vote. So um, Ms. O'Meara, you haven't spoken. Um, is there anything you wanna say before we kind of try to determine a consensus? No, I, I, I appreciate the thoughtful discussion. I think I'm leaning toward A as well. Okay. All I, right, I, so do, I think G would stigmatize people. Hate to say that, so but I think that's true. Excuse me, how, okay. how would it stig stigma, stigma, stigmatize in what way and who? Well, when I said it, Keith, I was thinking that it's, it stigmatizes people by pushing them farther away from the house, putting them out on the, the residents out on the road to smoke as if it's kind of, they're, they're pushed away and it's, it's unusual in that area to see people so close to the, standing out there and smoking. Um, you, when I drive up and down or walk up and down that area, I don't see anybody kind of at the end of the driveway. Um, well, there's, no one, there's no one living there right now. Well, no, all, all along Northampton, there's a lot of houses on Northampton and I don't see people doing that. I, I assume yeah, that if people are smoking. This, this, if, if it becomes a no smoking area, the, the play, they'll be on the sidewalk itself. Right. So being on a bench at least 15 feet from the sidewalk and surrounded by uh, evergreens and a fence, uh, I, I don't understand who you're stigmatizing. And we're talking here about, not about the smokers, we're talking about the non-smokers. Those are the ones who we're trying to protect. And A is closer to the building and around the, the patio and the parking area and everything. So for me, it's, it's better for them to be further away from the building than uh, close to the building or closer to the building with alternate A. Uh, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's not gonna stigmatize the smokers. Doesn't make sense to me. So I think we, I think I hear a consensus that there's not, a, there's not a consensus to, to vote this or to make this a non-smoking property. And if I'm wrong, any members of the, the board speak up. So now I think we have a choice between A and G, as Alt A and Alt G. 
I, Joan has mentioned, uh, Ms. Omira has mentioned Alt-A. Mr. Maxfield, I think you mentioned Alt-A. I mentioned Alt-A. Ms. Parks, do you have a preference for Alt-A or Alt-G? And Mr. Langsdale has evidenced a, pressure, a preference for Alt-G. Ms. Parks, do you have a preference for one or the other? Um, I, I do have one question before I say. Yep. Um, is there a big cost differential between these two things now that with the new location of A, there needs to be a retaining wall? There is a cost differential. Um, Alt-A is going to be more expensive because it has a structure and some additional grading. Um, I, you know, I don't think we're talking a huge magnitude of scale, so I wouldn't say that cost should be the driving determiner um, of this decision. I also would say to, to Mr. Lang's comment about the pavilion, it's a pavilion is a big word for what's really a tiny kind of covering. And the covering came to be because neighbors requested it. So initially it was just a bench. And then people said, oh, people have to be covered while they're outside smoking. And, and so we added it. So it's, but it's very modest. It's, it's like an eight foot by six foot, you know, it's, it's a rain cover. Um, so it's not gonna fit a huge group of people under it. Ms. Parks. Um, so I, I would say that I prefer all a, um, alternative A as well. Okay. Well, it looks like we have, for polling of the committee, not a vote, we have some direction for you. Uh, for the next um, meeting on a location. All right? Yep. Okay. Excuse Let's, me. Uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Langsdale. How is that not a vote? Because we didn't have a roll call. We're just trying to give them... You did have a roll call. I, I, didn't, I didn't call a vote. I said we were just trying to get polling to, get, to try to determine a consensus so we can move off the topic. But I think... And, I, and, I, and we typically vote on these things in a public meeting and not in the meeting portion and not the, not the hearing portion. And we're not, and we're, this would be part of the conditions and we're not doing conditions tonight. So I'm just trying to give them a consensus so they can move forward, a consensus of the board so we can move forward. All right, any other discussion on smoking areas? Let's move to the second question, which is um, sections, massing sections right. and drawings. Thank you. So we, we took, um, Chris Brestrup helps us with a sample um, that we followed to try to give a sense of the relative, this is very approximate, the relative height and massing of the different structures that are in the immediate area of the proposed building. So essentially what this section is doing is it's kind of cutting through the middle of the building that we've proposed, as well as the two buildings here and the field house here. And then it's kind of dropping them down and it's showing you, it's using the, the town's kind of topographical data about Northampton Road, which as we kind of know, goes up in these little kind of hills and plateaus. Um, and again, a, an approximate height of the neighbor at 126, an approximate height of 132, approximate height and massing of the field house. This was the most interesting part to me. This little black stub here is an eight foot high fence. And what it made me understand was there would have to be a massively high fence <laughs> to actually screen a view from here over to here. And that's mostly a function just of the topography of the site. Um, the better approach seems to be not not to say we we don't we're proposing a fence we're not changing that but that that these are the mature height of trees that are proposed as plantings um, in the landscaping plan. Um, the other thing to think about with these two buildings is just that this one sits further forward so that they're looking down kind of in this area. They're not really looking down directly at this building per se. Um, do people have questions about this? It's a little, it's a little tricky to, to understand it and I'm sure Rachel will be happy to answer questions. Yeah. 
people understand that? Okay. Oh, I have Ms. a question. O'Mara. I don't see the raise hand option. Oh, well, I, I saw your hand this time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, so, I'll, look, I'll look into why you didn't see that. Let me, oh, me meanwhile, but continue. So I have a, um, a statement. I am still struggling with demolishing those beautiful spruce trees. There was a tree that came down tonight right across from there, but it was not any of the spruces, it was an oak. And I actually went out there to see it and I still have trouble really accepting that as a viable option. I just wanna put it out there. Other comments? So I think we understand. I think we understand the the massing. Great. Should I move along? Yep. So there was a question because the, the renderings and the elevations were not quite at the same level of development, and so it's a little confusing. So what we did is we brought the elevations, which are the kind of two dimensional looks at the building up to the level of detail that we know at this time. So this is the elevation of the side of the building that would be facing the field house. Uh, and you can see the double doors that would be leading out to the patio are here. Um, we did um, move this horizontal band we talked about last time. It was a little higher before it just it was it was not the proportions didn't seem quite right so it's been recentered a little bit. Uh, this is the elevation of the building. This is the main entry that would be facing the driveway. The grades that you're seeing here are, are approximate. This is the side of the building that would be facing Northampton Road. And then this is the back of the building that would be facing the track. And then we had a question about kind of what would this potentially this material on the ground floor look like. So I just pulled, you know, a sample of what I thought a stone veneer might look like um, that would be kind of in this section here. Again, looking to kind of echo the treatment that's on the field house where the upper is brick and the lower is kind of a, a gray granite looking stone. And that's all we have for pictures tonight. So if you go to the, the rear, the, the view of the building that's facing the track, there's yep. two two doors here. Yep, there's, yep. Are they, there's, so there's two doors here and there's two doors on the other side. Is that right? There's this, this would be e exiting the common area. Yeah. Um, and this is more of just a fire egress. It would okay. probably be an out only door, be locked from the outside. And then is there a, if you get to the, the view facing the track, so I guess that's A5 1.0. That's, this one's facing the track, that's the back. Excuse me, that's the facing the parking lot, I should have said, I'm sorry. 1.0, 5.10. Sorry. That's a, there you go, that one. Yeah. So this, these two go out to the patio, right? Yes. The two here, and then you have, you have a door, a third door on the other side. I right. I understand. Yeah, right. and it's really to just, you know, open it up. A lot yep. of connection between the indoor and the outdoor space. Uh, and then the, under the gables, it's sort of a crosshatch look. Are, are you having um, scalloped, <laughs> sort of, you know, or, or what, what's up there? Yeah, so I think, I think the main purpose of this is to show that we would have a contrasting siding. These, I yeah. think, are supposed to meant to be shingles, yeah. kind of traditional yeah. New England shingles. Single look. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And then the, you use cement or concrete siding, um, is right. what we're talking about, right? Okay, got it. Yep. Yep. So that, they would look very much like wooden clapboards, but they wouldn't be wood. Questions from the board regarding the site, the elevations, materials, the look of the building. 
great. I found that helpful. I, is there okay. anything else? That, that, those are the questions that we had from yep. the meeting two weeks ago, if I remember right. Yep. Great. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, the next item on the agenda is, is the discussion of waiver requests. And um, we had a, the packet you got today is a, is a big packet. It's a lot of stuff. It's more than can be um, digested. And um, you can't, you're not, I don't, I'm not able to, and I suspect you're not able to make a decision on all these waivers in such short order. But I think we, I don't want to waste the meeting time and I don't want to waste this meeting. I'd like to go through these waivers um, so that we all understand them. So at the next meeting, when we consider waivers and conditions, um, we will have had, had a discussion about these and you will have time to look at the waivers um, over the next week or two weeks, over the next week, I think. So um, my intention is not to vote on these, but to discuss them, to give us an opportunity to, to ask questions, the applicant to respond on the need and the town um, staff to help us understand them. And that's really what this is about. So um, I propose that we go to the waiver request that Maureen sent out today that you all received, it looks like this, the um, review of waiver dated October 7th. And we'll use that as our, our kind of starting point and as a discussion document that we can work off of. And what I intend to do is I'll kind of introduce the subject, the specific waiver and try to describe it. Um, Rob and Dave and Maureen, to the extent that I, because I'm not an expert in this, to the extent that I have mischaracterized it or mis uh, described it inaccurately, please feel free to correct me. And I'd like the applicant, um, Laura or, um, or Jane, to comment on the reason for it and why you need that waiver request. Does that make sense from, uh, as a, from everybody? All right, let's do that. Um, so the first one is article, um, is waiver of section 2.04 special district, which is also, includes also um, section 2.22. What this really involves, to the best of my knowledge, is the actual uh, lines of the ED zoning district, which come across a very narrow portion of the property at the rear of the property. And that under, under zoning requirements, you, it would have to be um, anything on the uses of the property on, within that ED zoning district have to be educational. And the zoning bylaws intend that they be buildings only owned by Amherst College, Hampshire College, or the University of Massachusetts. So it seems to me that this is a, what, this, what we have here is a, um, a, a, a discrepancy in zoning lines as opposed to the intention of the zoning bylaw. And the applicant is asking for us to waive the, um, the requirements of the ED zoning district so that they can uh, have their, have their uh, building on, in this site. If I describe that correctly, uh, Rob or Dave? That sounds yes, correct. Yeah. It's good. This is good enough. All right. Um, Valley, do you want to discuss the need for this? Is there any more to say? Uh, I just would say that there is. Um, language in section 2.02 .02 that says boundaries which appear to follow public or institutional property lines shall coincide with such property lines. And in our case, the line is a little bit off the property line. Right. And we think it's like a Scrivener's error. It's a mapping yeah. error. Um, so that's how we're treating it. Any questions or discussions from members of the board? All right, that seems to me to be fairly straightforward. The second one is uh, 3.21, educational district. But this, again, is the same kind of uh, issue. Um, if we're going to waive 2.04, it makes no sense not to waive 3.21, which says the use of the land in an educational district has to be for a college, it's intended to, the zoning map, um, in fact, owner managed by them, by colleges, all setbacks and rear yards in that area, in that, um, in that ED zone have to be within 50 feet of, that are within 50 feet of a boundary have to conform with the neighboring um, zoning district 
requirements, which makes no sense in this instance, and the off deals with off street parking, which really isn't applicable in this case. Um, it seems to me that this is another case where we just were trying to clear up, which is a surveyor, surveyor's error or a inaccuracy in the lot lines, or maybe just a, an inadvertent mistake. Um, does that describe it accurately? Yes. All right. Valerie, do you want to say anything about this? Great. Any board members have concerns about this? All right. We'll move on. Article three use regulations. Um, 3.323 deals with the number of apartments in a building. Um, it also deals with whether it, uh, uh, apartments can be located if they're close to a heavily traveled street, close to a business and commercial educational district or in an area already developed for multifamily use. Um, I think the, those requirements are met in this area. Um, each building in this area has to have three more than no fewer than three apartments have to have no fewer than three or more than 24 dwelling units. This proposal has 28 dwelling units, so we need a waiver of that requirement. Um, in addition, I think it meets the additional side rear yard per floor, uh, two, two foot additional side and rear yard per floor requirement uh, of the zoning bylaw. Um, I'm learning this as I'm going through it, so please uh, give me a, a second. We'd also we'd also grant a, ask for a waiver to um, allow to exceed the maximum number of apartments in a building, a waiver to allow the building all the apartments to be of the same size, and that is the number of bedrooms. It's a waiver would grant a waiver for uh, not necess necessitating a re review by the Amherst Design Review Board. But because that's a part of a comprehensive permit, it isn't needed. Uh, and if you have a comprehensive permit, and to grant a waiver for a special permit application for apartment building accessory uses, which would normally be part of the special permit process, but because we have a comprehensive permit process, we don't need to have be bound by the rules of a special permit process. So we would take care of it here. Um, I think that is the crux of the request for the waiver of. 3.323. There's also, I guess, one other thing is that this one other justification for the for the waiver request, if I am reading this correctly, is that the um, the units will all be for affordable housing, and therefore, that it meets the town's definition of usable of affordable housing, and there is. Um, grace, I guess, granted or um, consideration should be given to creating affordable housing and um, perhaps waivers are, are more applicable in that case or more uh, justifiable in those cases. Is Dave and Rob and Maureen, have I missed anything on that? No. Okay. The Valley, do you have a just uh, so, point you want wish to make, Mr. Chairman. I do have our um, zoning uh, waiver table in a PowerPoint format that I could put on the screen, and I'm honestly not sure if it would help or hurt. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 it's very handy. It's very good. That 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 would be that handy. Very, but no, no, no. I, no. But I, I think that's a good way to to look at. It's like a great table of contents. But we're going to have to deal with these documents okay. eventually, so we might as well deal with them now. But it's a great okay. reference sheet, and it's what I use. Okay. It's very handy, right? That's fine. So I know um, I think it's very good. I think the area of grace is that um, the the zoning requires no more than fifty percent of units being of any one size, except if you're doing affordable housing, then you That's can right. get permission to to not meet that requirement. Thank you. Yep. That's correct. Questions from the board regarding that provision, that waiver request. Okay. The next is section five, filling of land. Any filling of land is accessory to the development of the property, which raises the existing grade more than 5,000 square feet or more in area than the average of two or more feet. 
to require a special permit. Now, um, we, we are in the, the comprehensive permit process and therefore it supersedes the, the uh, special permit process. So we can deal with, we can waive the requirement for a special permit when we're doing a comprehensive permit. That's essentially the, the, the purpose of the 5.00 general accessory waiver. Just, just a second, Felicity, hold on a second. Mr. Waskevich or Mr. Mora, Maureen, any comment on that? Uh, just to clarify uh, f uh, section, uh, the applicant's waiver under section 5.00 is uh, in regards of their assess their proposed accessory uses. I, I for some reason, yeah. I heard you say filling of land. I'm That's looking at the wrong 1. thing. It's 5.1, I hit, I hit the wrong five. Yeah, and uh, I would like to just point out, I don't know why, but um, people's option to use the raise the hand button for panelists uh, specifically may not be uh, used. Could someone try it, um, to be honest? Uh, I know Felicity, for instance, you physically raised your hand. Were you able to press a button? No. I don't, uh, yeah, so, oh, but Dave is, Dave is allowed, okay, so maybe, I, I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, so I guess if you just speak up as a panelist, but attendees are, um, when it time does come, um, it looks like uh, that, that function's still working. I, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Um, so uh, oh, let's see here. Okay, so anyways, yeah, so we should be looking at, if we wanna keep in order, um, we, we, uh, we're at um, the waiver request under section 5.00, uh, which is regarding the two accessory uses, which is the two offices um, that are in, inside the, the building. Right, thank you. Which would require a special permit. And we're waiving the, the need for a special permit because we have a comprehensive permit. Correct. Yep. Correct. Ms. Hardy? I was just going to make the same point, Mr. Judge. All right. Thank you. Any comments from board members regarding that? All right. The next is um, Article 4, 4.0. This is on page six of, of the 21 pages. Four methods may be utilized for developing land, residential purposes are section 3.3. Development standards. The applicant is requesting a waiver from the development method set forth in Article 4 under this comprehensive permit application. Article 4 of the bylaws is not applicable to this proposal, therefore the board does not take action. We don't need to, so we don't need to waive 4.0 and 4.1, is that the, the determination, even though that's the request for that? Um, uh, correct. So after um, talking with the building commissioner uh, this week, uh, we um, we determined that the, the, the there are various development methods. Um, these are four um, that are uh, specified under Article Four. However, um, they're not; uh, they don't deal with apartment buildings. Um, so, for instance, uh, under um, the four methods are in in regards of conventional residential mm -hmm. subdivision development. That's not uh, what's being proposed here. Uh, two cluster development that is not being proposed here. Uh, plan unit residential development. Um, PERD is the acronym that's not being proposed here. And open space community development um, is also not being um, proposed here. And so therefore those, uh, the, stand, the general standards that are applicable to those four um, different housing types um, are, again, is not being proposed here. And therefore um, the board does not need to take action regarding this waiver request. Ms. Baker. We erred on the side of being conservative in our list, um, aided and abetted by the planning department to, to, that it was safer to ask when we were not sure if something applied to us or not to ask. So we're certainly willing to be told we don't have to ask for this. That's fine. Any other comments? 
All right. Next, it does deal with filling of land. I, I jumped ahead. The applicant has submitted a cut fill analysis as shown in the streets we've received. The applicant is requesting a waiver from the section 5.10 of the zoning bylaw in order to allow quantities of cut fill as shown on sheet, sheet LC602. The cut fill analysis without need to file a separate special permit. The applicant states the necess necessary cut and fill is partially a function of stormwater management and partly a function of making the building and outdoor areas handicapped accessible. So this requires, this is another case where we're requiring a special permit for the cut fill analysis, which is not necessary if we're doing a comprehensive permit, but we're also, um, there, there may be conditions we wish to discuss, um, including a provision that requires the applicant to return to the board for review at a public meeting if any substantial changes are proposed to the cut fill analysis. What we have, I, it seems to me we have a preliminary cut fill a lot and we may have, once they're on the site, they may have different, um, they may have to do something different than they proposed in the cut fill analysis. Is that the reason this is stated that way, Maureen? Uh, correct. Uh, so, you know, as, as the applicant, you know, further develops the property, they may have to make changes. There could be there could be changes to the cut fill analysis, and therefore, mm -hmm. if there is substantial change, um, you know, the condition would require that the applicant come back to the board for review and uh, and approval um, of of those changes. Okay, it seems a reasonable a reasonable um, condition for our consideration at our next meeting. I do have the cut fill analysis ready, queued up if you want to see it again. Um, I think the issue is just we're moving enough dirt that we trigger a threshold that requires a special mm -hmm. permit. Um, You're moving more than the 5,000. Yeah. yeah, it's a slightly slopey and we're almost kind of evening it out. So that's the short version of it. Any just questions or concerns from board members? All right. I, so I, I would I, I would add, um, so if you back up to the page, pre, uh oh, um, so section, so again, we're looking at article five uh, or yep. uh, section 5.10. And then there's, I guess you would call them subsections, um, which are, you know, um, if there was a special permit requirement for a filling of land, um, 5.10, one zero zero through five point one oh four are are commonly um, conditioned um, sec, uh, are commonly conditioned as part of a special permit uh, decision and um, and so um, I would suggest that the board um, take a look at that as possible conditions for um, uh, for consideration. All right. So these will be conditions that we'll put in the draft conditions that we'll put to the board members for our next meeting. Correct. Okay. Article six, dimensional regulations. The applicant is requesting the following waivers from article six, table three. So um, asking for waivers from additional lot area for 28 units. Applicants, you would require additional lot areas for 28 units. You're requesting a waiver for that. Um, lot coverage, you're present. The um, required, what's currently required in RG is 40% you're requiring, you're, you're at 45.59% and you're requesting a waiver under the comprehensive permit for that. And I Correct. expect a lot of that um, is driveway and parking as yep. opposed to just the structure. Yeah. And if, again, if I may say, uh, we erred on the conservative side in that calculation and we included the grass paved parking areas as part of the, that um, lot coverage, so. Okay. Uh, 
family lottery for family the board may wish to consider granting footnote m of the zoning bylaw i'm not i'm not familiar with that i have to admit <laughs> i don't know can you help us with, can you help us out with that yeah, is that a sure okay so um so let's back up so a basic minimum lot area for like a, a single family home in the rg would require uh, 12,000 square feet. Um, the applicant is, uh, and then for every uh, additional lot area, uh, there's a, um, for every additional unit proposed on the property, um, there's additional um, lot area that's required. And um, provision M, I mean, foot, footnote M, um, let me just go to this. It says, in addition to the areas required by this table, table three, dimensional regulations, for any existing dwelling unit on the lot, the density for new townhouses and apartments shall not exceed one dwelling unit per 4,000 square feet of the remaining lot area, or in the case where there is no existing dwelling unit of 4,000 square feet for each dwelling unit beyond the first unit. So, so you would take the, um, the, the basic minimum lot area of 12,000 square feet, that's for one unit. Yeah. And then, um, so that's unit one. Then for the 27 units, uh, that would be uh, 4,000 square feet times 27. And- That's how that, you get to the 120 square feet, 120,000 square feet. Correct. Yep. And, so the applicant is requesting a waiver from that requirement um, to allow 28 units to be built on a 38,252 square foot property under the comprehensive permit. Comments, questions? Okay. And, and the reason, and Laura and, and the applicant um, certainly should chime in here, um, you know, the board, you know, may wish to consider granting that waiver uh, request from Article 6, Table 3, Footnote M, uh, under this uh, permit, because, uh, you know, a, as the applicant has indicated in previous presentations, that fewer apartment units would, would make this proposed project uneconomic. Um, and so um, that would be, um, you know, the, the reason why 28 units are, is being proposed at this property. The next um, waiver is on maximum, in that same area is on maximum lot coverage. And again, um, I know that you said you were conservative in your, in your numbers, but the, uh, you exceed the lot, the lot coverage um, of 40% by some amount. Um, and it's up to us to decide whether the lot coverage is appropriate given the size and density and whether it meets the, the overall goals of the town to provide affordable housing. And if it's, it's a balancing act. So that's yeah. again, uh, another thing to, to uh, consider. Ms. Baker. What's interesting to me when I look at this table is we're at about half of the zoning allowance for building coverage, um, but we're way over on unit coverage. And again, it's the disconnect in the fact that we have these really tiny units. And if they were, you know, as we've talked about before, we could build seven, you know, four bedroom units and it would be a bigger size building potentially than this one. So just, just to remind people of that, that we're building at an odd size of unit. And so when there are measures that are given on a per unit basis, it, we just don't, this type of property doesn't fit very naturally into that kind of formula. The next waiver is minimum side yard waiver. Um, you're looking for an, ex you have an accessory structure having a, feet, a height of six feet or less shall be set back a minimum of three feet from the side lock line. The structure over six feet shall be set back a distance equal to its height. 
And I think you're here talking about the um, the bike rack, the um, the bike rack, the trash area, and one other. Is, is there another structure back there that are going to be set on the lot line or set very yeah. close to the lot line, but within yeah. this? And you're asking for a waiver of the um, the setback. Right. So there's there's the bike rack. Um, there's a trash dumpster area with a fence around it. Um, and there's a little kind of eight by eight storage gardening shed. And they're all, none of them are within three feet of the lot lines. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, and I was saying there's the um, possible smoking shelter. Right. So we'd have oh, yeah. to add that if we add that. take the direction that you're giving tonight, and we'd need to make a new waiver or amend our make waiver request to include that uh, pavilion. It looks like um, you've also um, been conservative and asking for a, a waiver to 6.132. It looks like that's dealing with general business and neighborhood business and light industrial districts. Um, I don't, right. it does not look like we need to waive that. So we'll drop that. Yep. Uh, 6.134 gazebo structure, single story. Use location to post dimension. I'm not sure why. Maureen, can you help us on this? Why do we need the waiver 6.134? located within the side yard behind the front line of the principal building. Oh, I see. You're not gonna be behind the front line of the principal building. Is that correct? So I it think says we here are. I'm not located sure. Located within the side yard behind the front line of the principal building. If you're off to the side, the front line would be the line that runs across the front of the property. In any case, this looks to be um, a mat, a, a matter of where a building is on the site. Um, Rob or Dave, can you help us out on this? Is that, does this need to be waived? Uh, so 6.34, yeah, yeah. So 6.34 talks about under a special permit to be able to uh, be located oh. closer. So I think that may be where the waiver is. That's it. You're right. It's just because we, we're we're not doing a special permit. We're doing a comprehensive permit. Okay. So we still need that. I understand. Thank you. Six point one four minimum rear yard. Again, this we're talking about the dumpster, um, bike storage. A storage shed, a light wall. Um, it was in the the, sec, the the setback. That seems to me that that's just dealing with that issue. Correct? Yep. Am I correct, Maureen? Correct. Yep. This is it's pretty much the same issue that we've had before. Exactly, but this is uh, uh, regarding the rear setback opposed to the side. The side setback. All right. Section 6.2 fences. Fences and walls shall not exceed four feet in height. You're asking now for a eight foot high fence. Is that correct? Correct. Along that portion of the side lot line. Yep. Um, the pros fence is at the request of the abutting neighbor. Um, the applicant is requesting a waiver from section 6.24 the zoning bylaw. That seems pretty straightforward. You want to be eight feet when the zoning says it's only six. No right. waiver from that. And then we have the setback from the lot line. It would normally need to be set back as high as the, um, no, we have to be set back from the lot line. And you're proposing eight, eight. the eight foot fence right on, on the lot line, correct? It's probably, Rachel, maybe you can tell me, it's usually set back like six inches or something. It, it's usually not right on the lot line. Yeah, it's within six inches. Sorry. It's what, Ms. Loeffler? It's within six inches of the lot line. Six inches. But it would it would need a, a waiver from yep. the other. You'd be within mm -hmm. the zone where you'd need a waiver. So that's really what that deals with. Yep. Any comments from 
board members regarding the fence. The need for a waiver. All right. Parking and access regulations, 7.0, Article 7. Um, first off is needing two parking spaces for every dwelling unit. Um, you provide, you would need under the bylaw 56 parking spaces for 28 units. You're proposing 16, two of which are ADA accessible, I think. Yep. Okay. Um, you're at requesting a waiver from this to allow um, 16 parking spaces under the comprehensive permit. We've talked a lot about parking in this. Is there anything else? That's pretty much all it's straightforward is the, the request for the waiver is just that you wanna have less parking spaces than required. Um, anything else regarding this, Ms. Baker? No. Nope. Any questions from board members about the need for the waiver of this uh, requirement for 56 parking spaces and only providing 16? Okay. I'd like to say, uh, if, if I may, yep. uh, yes. members, uh, keep in mind uh, as we're going through these topics, if you have, you know, possible conditions that you would like uh, to be discussed at, uh, uh, um, you know, future public hearings, um, please uh, chime in. Yeah, ra raise your hand. Like on this one, it may be that you want to say something about, you can announce that you have a desire or an interest in having some of the parking spaces. Um, available for snow re snow removal or snow storage. I mean, that's those kinds of things we can talk about in conditions. But just raise the issue if it's important to you. Um, landscaping for parking areas, shared parking, and driveway length. I'm reading off your cheat sheet, um, Ms. Baker. And yep. it seems to me that Paving for the, per so we'll get to those in a second, but paving is the, is the first, um, the first waiver request on asphalt driveway for the purpose. Of, I mean, that's what you're requesting. You do have uh, some uh, pavers. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yep, please. Uh, well, actually, let me refer to the cheat sheet. I, I don't, th I think I might've just added that in just, um, I don't think you're requesting a waiver to that. Hold on no. a second. I don't think so either. No, yeah. no. Uh, but I decided to include the entire um, section of, of seven regarding parking. Just all right. Well, we I, don't need a we don't need a a waiver for seven point one seven point one zero one. I don't think we need a waiver for seven point one zero two. Um, setback from the building seven point one three zero three. I think you meet the application, the requirements of that. 7.104, um, you're asking for small car parking. And yeah. Parking areas and five or more spaces. So it should be painted, marked, and otherwise delineated. Um, the eight proposed parking spaces located on the asphalt pavement, including the two ADA spaces, are nine by 20 feet. And eight mm -hmm. parking spaces located on the grass crate pavers are eight by 8.5 by 20 feet, which is a compact car or a small car space. Mm -hmm. You're asking a waiver to allow 50% of the proposed parking spaces to be designated for small vehicles. That's I think it's actually a waiver. Question. It's a waiver from the special permit. So you can have 50% of your spaces just anyway with a special permit. And so the waiver is just about not having a separate spe special permit. All right, Qu questions, comments from town or from board members? All right. Lighting. Adequate lighting should be provided for all parking spaces of five spaces or more. These lights are to be used at night. All exterior light associated with parking areas shall be downcast and shall be directed or shielded to eliminate light trespass onto a budding property or to any street. Um, it also calls for adjacent properties to be protected from light intrusion. You have The 
these are all, if I'm correct, you, you have downcast, dark high sky compliant lighting. You've shown them to be low, I think, on the, they only come up a little bit on the property. And then there's, is there one tall light? Um, if I remember, no, they're all. So they're, they're, they're short. Shepherd's, Shepherd's Crook kind of style lamp posts in the parking area. And we, at the recommendation of the board, they were originally 12 feet in height and they were reduced to 10 feet in height. And then we got one more of them so that we could provide adequate low light throughout the parking area. So you seem to meet the requirements of the lighting. All right. Do we need to, is there a waiver needed for that, Maureen? No. Uh, again, yeah. okay. no, I decided though right. that the board should be reviewing the this section in in its entirety. Yeah, and I, and we have we we have interest in making sure that the downcast and uh, dark sky compliant lighting is always used. Um, again, I don't think you I don't think you need a waiver from the entrance and exit of the driveway. No. All right, but it's laid out so it meets the standards. Landscape 7.11, landscape standards. 10% um, total parking areas, landscape is open space. Um, they have new planning along the perimeter of the parking areas and drive. And it is landscape tree island. Um, so it's 7.11. 7.111 is for those over 25. So 7.110 may apply, but um, you're saying that you have enough. I, I suspect you're asking for a waiver from that because it would be uh, extend the, the parking area to a large degree if you had to put in these um, parking um, landscape islands, right? Right. I don't think the grass creek counts as landscaping. So between the grass creek and the asphalt, we don't have enough islands of green. We just have one yep. essentially space that's got a tree in it. Um, and that's what we're able to fit. And you're asking for a waiver from that requirement. In that yes, regard. yep. Comments from the town or from board members? Um, I don't think 7.111 doesn't apply, 7.112, five or more spaces. Screening parking areas of five or more spaces shall provide effective screening for parking from the adjacent streets or properties. Screening may be a depressions in grade three or more feet, hedge wall, or any type of appropriate work with the structure. Um, you, are, you're, you are proposing a fence um, in place of the trees in order to screen this. Um, and and so as not to imply and to not to impair driver safety, so that the fence doesn't go too far towards the towards the, the road. Um, um, uh, Mr. Chair, so I, again, I don't know why we need a waiver on this. Go ahead. Maureen. There's no waiver request. Yeah. All right. Is that where you're going to say, Rachel? Uh, uh, yep. We also are using a lot of vegetation for screening throughout on both sides of the drive um, to help with that too. Okay, any other comments? Shared or lease parking. Um, I don't know that this is, you're not sharing, you're not leasing the parking space to anybody. You don't anticipate doing that, do you? And you're not leasing parking for from other places for this place. No. So again, it's it's good to have everything there, but I don't think we need a, a waiver of this specific section, do we, Maureen? Correct. So the applicant did okay. list this as a waiver request, but so the accessory uses proposed the for the RSC and the I don't know the property manager office. Those yep. are accessory to the principal use, the apartment building, and so. Um, so this section for shared parking is is not um, is not applicable. It'd be like you know, uh, property over here there's a use. Property over here there's a right. use. 
they're going to share, but this is uh, the two accessory uses are um, the On two the property or the two uses, the opposite mm -hmm. are accessory to the principal use. Therefore, this section is not applicable. Got it. Um, turnarounds located at the end of the common driveway for fire and other emergency. So we have Amherst Fire Department um, saying that they are comfortable with the um, design. The design should take into consideration the 25 foot turning ridges for a cab or over design, cab over design fire apparatus. Have the, have, what was the fire department's conclusion on this, Maureen? Were they, were they satisfied with this or did they want this changed? Um, I'm gonna let um, Rachel. I'm gonna <laughs> um, we've had multiple conversations with Michael Roy uh, with the fire department and and talking through the radius consideration. Um, the location of the driveway um, is set and the curb cut and the radius uh, is such that if we increase the radius of the drive, um, we start to impact the neighbor's property by our radius, given the location of the drive. And um, then given the grades on the site, um, our location of the driveway is sort of set. So in speaking with Michael Roy, he was willing to accept uh, a 25 foot radius on the, on the west side um, and keep our proposed 15 foot radius on the east side. He just needed a way for them to back out um, and maneuver in one direction. So does, Maureen, do we have something to that effect from the fire department or will we get it? We, we will get a memo from him. Okay. We've, uh, we've had um, my office and, uh, and Mike Roy, the fire prevention officer, uh, him and I have had uh, multiple phone conversations. So he just needs to formally submit a memo to the, to the board regarding that. So we'd want a condition that that's yes. the case. Yep, so another thing to add to the condition. Okay. So the, the town engineer has to um, approve or I guess you say stamp for the town engineer, the, the uh, driveway and drainage. Um, are we going to hear back from the town engineer or have we yet heard from, the, from them? Yes, uh, so um, the town engineer has provided comments uh, to to the board regarding this, and um, he uh, he's prepared to work with the applicant with. Um, let's see here, one second. I, um, I, he is prepared to work with the applicant regarding any, you know, plans that would need to be required for his purposes. But the board should um, should consider making a, a few conditions regarding um, the driveway and drainage. Um, I do mm -hmm. list here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So are the two bulleted items that you have on your on its possible conditions. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So one is all parking areas shall be designed and constructed to prevent stormwater drainage from leaving the project site. All stormwater runoff shall be directed to the stormwater drainage system for treatment and um, and and, uh, and, uh, and and I don't know how to say that. And then the other one is uh, any substantial changes from the preliminary drainage plan that is approved as part of the plan of record shall be reviewed and approved by the board. Attenuation is what you're I knew for. that. I just yeah. didn't want to say it out loud. Sorry. You got it. All um, right, those are but I, consider um, those under consideration. I, I um I will loop back with Jason Skills, the town engineer, about that um, and see okay. if he has any other um, possible conditions that he would like included. All right. 
then we have sign regulations. Again, comments from board or town. We'll move on to sign regulations then. Um, essentially what you wanna do is you wanna put up a, a temporary sign regarding the project um, for you and contractors and during the construction period. Yep. And you need, a, you need a waiver to do that, correct? I believe that we do. Um, it, there is a temporary sign uh, section of the zoning permit, but it, you can only leave the sign up for three weeks. So we yeah. typically yeah. are required actually by the Department of Housing and Community Development to put up a, a pretty hefty sign thanking the governor and everyone else prominently displayed and it has to stay through the whole period of construction, which is you know a lot longer than three weeks. So we were just hoping to get we're trying to roll as many permissions into this as we can. So I think we probably want to have a sign, a, a, a copy of the sign or a model of the sign before the board. And on the condition on this waiver, we probably uh, want to be specific amount of time, you know, during construction period or something else. But I would suspect we'd want to see a mock-up of the sign, right? perhaps at a later point for a public meeting. We can consider that during um, conditions. You're only proposing one sign. That's well, all you need is one I big sign. That, or... I guess that's a question. We, we do one big sign and all the funders are acknowledged. Often the contractor, as they would anywhere they're working, wants to put up their own construction sign. It's usually not a huge thing, but I mean, you see them everywhere when people are working on a, a property. So I guess I'm wondering how much latitude we have to put up that kind of signage on a temporary fence. Well, I think what you do is come back to us next week with what you want and let okay. us know. And we, all right. Okay. So if it's, if you think your, your contractor is going to want to sign, come back to us and say, we want two signs. Here's what the, the big sign is going to look like. And we will have okay. a sign of X size for the contractor and, and we'll see what, how we view that. All right. Okay. Do you guys want to Ms. sign? <laughs> Ms. Hardy. I just was going to point out to Laura, if there are any um, other signs that would need be needed for uh, vendors during the construction phase, you might want to think about that. Uh, you're requesting a waiver. The next is a special permits for um, pedestrian seat. 10.387 uh, uh, requires um, for a special permit, we have to find that safe and vehicular and pedestrian movement around the site. Um, you've submitted a traffic report. You want us to deem the, tap, the traffic report as part of this comprehensive permit uh, to be sufficient given that there's minimal traffic impact. Um, we have the copy of the traffic report. Yep. The town engineer still has to comment on that report. Is that correct? He did comment. Yeah. Nope, he commented. He, he was satisfied with it. And uh, I actually I uh, didn't get a chance to forward to the board, but I I, I uh, had an email correspondence with the town engineer today, and he does so. The applicant submitted a hold on. This applicant submitted a traffic report slash summary, and um, the town engineer does not feel that it's necessary for the applicant to submit a traffic impact report. Right. Which is so, there, so, so therefore, if they don't have to submit an, an impact report. A traffic example, impact, yeah. So they submitted a traffic, yeah. it's, it gets traffic report. Yeah, so they submitted yeah. a traffic report. Um, they did not submit a traffic impact report, but the town engineer is satisfied and does not feel that that's necessary. Right. So we, need, so we would need a waiver of, of 10.387 for the traffic impact report. Got it. Correct. Um, before we move on, I've noticed that Mr. Malloy, uh, senior planner, um, has raised his hand. If you oh. want. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. I'm on my I'm on my phone. I don't know if you can see me, but I hope you can hear me. The um, it was about the sign, the temporary sign. So you know, with the block grant project, there's a number of um, as Laura said, a number of acknowledgements that have to be made. And so we just, you know, we just have the contractor put up like a four by eight piece of plywood, you know, on, on like four by fours 
and you know both sides of it can then be um, used. You know, it's basically like a, a larger board that then different signs can be put on. So like you know you might have to put wages, you know any uh, labor standards reporting. If the if there's not a trailer on site, you have to put like labor standards posters. Um, you know, and it's it you know they may have something a little bit more um, decorative, but you know we'll, we you know sometimes we'll specify like a nice piece of plywood or you know then then gets put on with laminated signs, but it's it's something just it could be just as generic as that. I don't you know I'm not cause I don't I'm not sure they actually have like a sign design ready, you know, because there's a number of things. So I was thinking just like if there's a size sign they may request um, as opposed to actually seeing what a physical um, sign might look like. Maybe they just have an idea of how big it would be. Um, that's all because we usually just say a four by eight piece of plywood and then whatever signs are required by the funders there's space to put them up yeah in the case of the project we just finished in northampton um the cpa committee has a giant banner that went across the whole front of the site that said your cpa dollars at work <laughs> so we never really know what people are going to come up with <laughs> But yes, Nate, it's a good idea. We could have a four by eight sheet of plywood and everybody would have to fit their signs on it. So come back to us with the idea that we can then put into the conditions of the, of the approval. No, right, the next deal, any other questions or comments? Thank you, Nate. Any other questions or comments from board members or the town staff? All right, the next is site plan review, section 11.2. Um, you're asking that we waive the requirement for site plan review. The planning board has voted 7-0 to, to not to approve this. They don't think it needs a site plan review. It isn't necessary under a comprehensive permit decision. So that can be waived, seems to me, is a pretty straightforward um, issue there. Did I miss that? Is that correct, Maureen, or did I? So um, let's see here. So th this application um, does not require site plan review uh, by the planning board. Um, the applicant seems they were being conservative and listed 11.2, section 11.2 um, as part of their waiver request, but it's not, it's not required. Um, however, you know, uh, when we when the ZBA received this application, um, we submitted uh, the the application to all to various town boards and departments for review and comment. And the planning board was one of those um, was one of those that did receive that. And they um, the applicant went and, and presented uh, their proposal and the board and the planning board voted to, uh, I believe, to recommend to approve this project to the ZBA and they came up with um, provided comments and recommendations, which is included um, in your your handout here. So the board, if uh, the board here, to, uh, the, the ZBA could consider making um, the planning board's recommendations as conditions of the permit. Part of the conditions, mm -hmm. right? Makes sense. And those conditions are uh, raising the white band, which you've, which you've done in your drawing, I think. Confirm the lighting plan is dark sky compliant and does not cast light. Consider, which we have as a condition anyway, consider increasing the amount of screening around the smoking pavilion. That's already been talked about and keep air intake for building and heating and cooling systems away from the smoking area. We've talked about that as well. So those can be, some of those are conditions and some of those are already taken care of the, in the plan. All right, article 13, demolition delay for structures of historical or architectural significance. We just received a, a letter from the Amherst Historic Commission. They did not find, uh, they supported the project. They did not find that it, uh, um, that they wanted to uh, oppose the demolition of the property and they did not want, they did not feel it necessary to delay the demolition of the property, which is one of the tools they use to give people a chance to um, consider whether the property ought to be just um, demolished or not. So um, they have reviewed that and we've received, uh, we received a letter from the Historic Commission. And the comprehensive permit would provide all the permits needed under necessary for this. Article 15 includes, includes the, uh, now this is my word that I'm having trouble with Maureen. 
inclusionary zoning. Um, I've not had a chance to review this. And so I am, is this something that we should discuss in depth tonight or is this make, does this make more sense to discuss at a later point in time uh, on inclusionary zoning? I'm well, looking I for think, some guidance on this one. Um, let's see here. So the applicant is, is proposing to a waiver request under this um, article 15, which is 15.12 and 15.14. Um, I think I think it would be healthy for the board to review those two sections tonight, and if needed, um, you know we have Attorney Witten and Rob Mora and and myself and Nate to discuss that. All right, can you? I think it'd be helpful for the applicant then to describe uh, the sure. requests for waivers under the inclusionary zoning. Sure. Um, so one waiver that we requested, um, the, the 15.12 says requires establishment of housing restrictions to ensure that affordable housing units will be available to eligible renters. We're asking the zoning board to waive the application of section 15.12 and acknowledge the application of section 15.13 that assistance programs used for construction of the project will govern affordability. So if this was a project that didn't have public other public money in it, the town might want to impose its own set of restrictions. Um, but we know that there will be many eyes um, from the various public funders. So we're asking for permission to rely upon those other funding sources to govern the affordability restrictions. Um, and 15.14 requires the affordable units to be comparable to market rate units. We don't have any market rate units. So we're just asking, we're just saying that we can't comply because we don't have any market rate units and all of our units will be comparable. So maybe arguably um, that section, section might not be applicable to this project. Um, right. So 15.13 uh, just is here says housing constructed by a public agency or nonprofit corporation using a federal state or local housing assistance program may adhere to the requirements set forth by the funding agency. Again, in lieu of having a set of local regulations. Just reading through it. All right, well, that's and 1513. We may, um, this may be the, time, the place in which some of the uh, concerns raised by Mr. Maxfield last meeting regarding um, the character of the building in the future, should there be financial stresses, is addressed. So, through a condition. So, that's why one of the things we have to think about is how in the future um, the, the character and the, the, of the the low income nature of the building uh, is maintained. But that will be discussed in, when we discuss conditions. Okay. Um, you see in Lua's. All right. I, so unfortunately, I, well, I'm, I'm, work, I'm continuing to work on the other waiver requests. That um, so we right now we have reviewed all waiver requests under the Amherst zoning bylaw. There is um, maybe ten other waiver requests um, that are fall under the Amherst general bylaw, other regulations, approvals, and requirements, all under um, local authority under um, the town of Amherst. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to um, review these now uh, without um, providing um, a sort of comment. I can sort of you know, Maureen, talk I think, out loud about them, but I haven't written anything. I think each of them, aside from the 3.50, the rental housing 
permit subsidized housing. Most of them look to be pretty cut and dried. I mean, it's work on the town road, dealing with local driveway permit, emergency access, um, the rental housing, rental permit subsidized housing that may require some discussion. But I think if, if you um, provide the summary for the next meeting on each of these, we can discuss it then, and I don't think it'll take a long time. Yeah, but sure. I think we should do, work off work off the common document that um, that you're going to create. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, Laura could speak to that waiver request uh, section under the general bylaw section three point five point five zero. Yep. One B rental permit subsidizing housing. So she's requesting to permit the applicant to provide annual certification that inspection. Yeah, let me let me ask about this because I'm a little confused too about what, what's asked here in this bylaw. Mm -hmm. So it, it reads where residential rental units are regularly inspected under the requirements of the Commonwealth or federal government, no self-inspection and certification shall be required. Annual certification by the owner that a rental unit has been inspected in accordance with the law of the Commonwealth or federal law shall be provided to the town and shall be accepted by the town as evidence of self-inspection as part of any permit application or renewal. I think what it's saying is that if we have an entity coming in, DHCD, whoever doing regular housing quality inspections, that that can take the place of a self-certification Yes. Yeah, so Rob or Nate, you can certainly chime in. So I believe Somebody speak to this. Yeah, I believe uh, Laura, this uh, property will require inspection from this from DHCD on an annual basis. And so that information um, could be supplemental to then report back to Amherst for our purposes. And then you would still be um, like all rental per rental properties in Amherst, you would be required to renew your annual rental permit. Mr. Mora? Uh, it's actually exactly what Ms. Baker uh, thinks it is as she described it. Uh, each application for a rental permit does require at a minimum a self-certification by the owner or property manager. Uh, for other properties, most commonly for us would be like a housing authority uh, yep. managed uh, complex uh, where there's a, uh, a state or federal inspector that comes in and looks at the units annually. We would uh, accept that report in lieu of the certification by the owner for each individual unit. Okay, so I don't really think this is a waiver. I think we're just stating what is already allowed under this section. I so, agree. okay. So we can take this off the list. So we will either annually provide verification of an outside entity having inspected the property or a self-certification if the timing doesn't jive with the rental application, um, a self-certification. Is that right, Mr. Morrow? That is correct. Okay. Um, there's another one of these I think that wants to come off the list. Um, 3.445 emergency access which is approval of style type and location of key vault by the fire department. We would like to withdraw this waiver request. We think it's actually gonna be simpler to just figure it out as we always do with the fire department and the general contractor in the field, rather than having the zoning board figure it out. Right. So you'll, the result of that is that you will comply with the request of the fire department. What yeah, they, we always would have. It, it just yep. we were trying to do it early, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to do no. it early. Um, I would note that two of the um, requests we've made, one was for the sewer connection permit to be basically issued as part of this comp permit, and the other was the water connection permit to be issued as part of this comp permit. The town engineer wrote back that we can't do that. So um, mm -hmm. yep. Maybe you just want to talk with him and th those may come off the list too, because he may say, no, you have to do it when you have X, Y, and Z plans in hand. And we want to hold the authority for giving that permit, even though maybe in theory, you could do it through a comp permit. Sure. No, I want, I, I, yeah, I wasn't aware of that, but it would seem to me that we'd want to be sure that uh, whatever is done, the engineering department approves of it <laughs> and is, yeah. And is uh, yeah so um, and then the we don't want to waive their 
Well, we have building uh, inspection staff on the call. We, we asked for a waiver from a separate inspection for demolition so that we could in effect pull a building and demo permit at the same time um, and have approval. At, the comp permit would give us approval to do that. And I don't know how the building department um, receives that request. Uh, well, we see it as not necessary because we would uh, typically be willing to grant a permit that includes both demolition and construction if that was the way that the timing worked out for the project. Yeah, this says requires inspection services approval prior to demolition of existing structure. So you go out and inspect prior to issuing the demo permit. It, it certainly could be an inspection prior to, but I think that usually would be uh, applications that are made under uh, Article 13, which would theoretically would be waived, uh, you know, for the demo delay purposes and okay. deemed not to be necessary. So there, I think the response would be there's no inspection, no permit needed, move ahead under the building uh, permit requirements under the state building code for demolition and or construction. Okay, so I don't okay. know that we need we don't this need that. special accommodation. Um, we'll just do it as usual. Yeah, Mr. Um, Nate Malloy is raising his hand. Mr. Malloy. Sure, yeah, thanks. When, um, with regard to the water and sewer connections yeah. um, for, mm -hmm. for public works with, with the North Square project and Beacon, yep. with these waiver requests, it was, you know, essentially, the reason why it's a waiver request um, you know, is that so that they don't have to come and apply for a separate permit. So I'd have to look at the way it was actually worded, but essentially allowed this to proceed with the condition that the applicant would comply with um, review and approval by public works at the time of, you know, at the time it's necessary. So you know, essentially we still wanted to bundle all the requests under this permit, but allow for public works to you know, review and approve the plans at a later date. So yeah. I, think, I, I don't want to, because, you know, otherwise, essentially, the Valley CDC is going to have to then go back and actually su submit a separate permit application at some future date, which is what, not, not right. I don't think that's what we want. We wanted to have it all bundled in under this permit. So I think there's a way to word that waiver and have a condition so that it, you know, right. it can be satisfied. And that would be super helpful on our end because when we go to the many attorneys who review this project, they look at those permits in terms of readiness. Um, is there water? Is there sewer? Prove it. So if you have the permits and you just need to kind of go back to finalize the plans, they're reassured that this property has public utilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then since since I guess we are kind of just going through all of them, the very first one work in town road, uh, I do need to um, check in again with the town engineer he, um, just to confirm everything. But um, so Northampton, that stretch of Northampton Road is actually owned by the state, Mass DOT. Yep. So um, I, I don't know if that's this section is applicable, um, but I, I'll okay. look to um, Jason Skills one more time. Okay. Is the same true for three uh, three point three driveway permit? Um, I I need the loop back with him. Okay. Um, that that might um, I'm I'm not sure of the answer. Okay. So so I guess what we have for next week then would be um, if you need to do something on the on three point three Working Town Road. And the local driveway permit, we can come up with something. Um, we don't need anything on. I, I don't think we need a waiver on emergency access. We don't need a waiver on rental permit, right. landscaping guidelines. Um, you've already talked with a consultation with the tree warden. I think we'd want to continue to have. I'm not sure about this one. We may want to discuss this next week, right? The waiver yeah. requirement, tree warden approval. Uh, I think the trees are an issue. So. Um, well, so his jurisdiction- so the tree vegetation removal and new plantings that shows and submitted plans. All we could provide all local permits, but separate requirement for tree warden approval. 
So the tree warden, it, his jurisdiction is for vegetation within the public right away. Yeah. Uh, so I, I need to check in with him. Um, maybe maybe uh, Rachel. Um, Rachel has her hand raised. So I might comment. This is Ms. Loeffler. Um, we reached out to the tree warden early in the process to confirm what sort of review they needed. And he indicated that due to mass DOT um, managing the right of way, that he actually didn't have jurisdiction over trees in the right of way along Northampton Road. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so uh, I just need to get him to uh, ask him to provide a memo for the board, but that would make sense. So, um, sure. Alan Snow. Alrighty. So, yeah. So it's just the first two and then the landscaping guidelines, which so um, if that's correct, then then that waiver request is not needed any longer. Right. And Nate's going to look at the sewer and the town water permit connection. Demolition isn't needed and development for plans. Oh, yeah. We uh, weren't really sure what that meant. I think yeah, that, that is like an umbrella sure. of like if that's you missed That's right. <laughs> so I picked this up from another comp permit. Um, actually, also this language came from um, KP Law, another attorney there. Um, it essentially says, if we all missed something, if our collective intention were to permit the project and we all missed something, um, this says to allow waivers to requirements in local bylaw and regulations relating to dimensional and use requirements to the extent necessary to build the project as presented on the plans um, and any subsequent final plans that may be subject to permitting authority approval. So we do commonly have a request from zoning boards to return with final plans just so that you can you know vet them before we pull a building permit um, and again I didn't make this up this came off of someone else's comp permit um, from a town attorney well it's like a, it's like a catch-all it is a catch -all. and I'm, I'm not always I'm not always comfortable with catch-all so yeah. I just maybe one we want to think about yeah I'm not I think we would um, want to give that some thought. Yep. But if it requires you to come back, it, it may be um, something that's reasonable just because this is a complicated process and we wouldn't want to have hold it up on the basis of just an inadvertent mistake. So, but on, in general, I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable with real catch-alls. So it kind of says, <laughs> whatever right. we, go ahead no matter what. So anyway, we'll give that some thought. Okay. Um, any other comments from the town or from board members regarding these um, these waivers? So the plan is for next week to have, um, to, I hope, to be able to vote on these, to consider these waivers, to vote on them, and to also start discussing um, conditions to the application. Yeah, uh, I guess my only comment is, you know, just so the applicants can sort of do a, a read through and see what needs what waivers that you've indicated uh, are no longer applicable. And I, I did re mention there were a few waiver requests that I felt that we might want to include. So um, as part of this application, so you, uh, I would just review the list and see what needs to be deleted and added. And, and then in context of um, this, the smoking area um, pavilion, if, if that's something that you're gonna move forward with regarding the side setback waiver. Mm -hmm. Okay. Comments from board members. I think that completes the discussion on and the review of waivers. Then at this time, um, it's about eight o'clock. I'd like to go to public comment. Um, and see any public comment, and then we can uh, come back and discuss the next uh, meeting and any other matters that are before the board, that the board members bring up. So if members of the public, if you wish to comment, this is the time to do that. The best way to do that is to, to use the raised hand function if you can. I think it, worked, it looks to work for me, use the raised hand function, and Maureen will identify um, public commenters. I think the first one is Elisa. Mm -hmm. Maureen. Sure. Okay. Hi, Elisa. I think, oh, Elisa, you Sorry. I'm, I think I'm unmuted now. 
are. Yes, you are. Just give your name and, and um, sure. an address for the record. Elisa Campbell, 27 Pine Grove. And I've been attending most of these meetings representing the League of Women Voters. And I'm here again tonight to say we continue to support this project. We're very aware that there are many people who do not have a home and who need a home. And this project seems to us to be an excellent way of helping 28 of those people have a home. So we hope that approval can happen soon. And we thank you very much for all your dedicated work. I don't, I don't know how many hours you put in, but it's a lot and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. George. Yes, thanks. Uh, my name is Steve George. I live on Dana Street near the project site. I've been interested in it uh, from the beginning for really one reason only. It has nothing to do with the people who live there and what their income might be. It is that uh, the density of units, that is 28 units instead of the normally allowed seven, is a very large deviation from what people in the neighborhood have come to expect um, for properties uh, nearby. We used to follow the zoning rules ourselves and it should require a high degree of need and support to get that much of an override or of a waiver. And I've listened to most of the um, meetings myself and um, I myself am perfectly satisfied that 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 standard has been met. I would like to see the ZBA kind of signal if it's possible to do so, that this is being done in this very specific case. It's not the special permit from a for-profit developer. It is uh, it's a comprehensive permit for a very different purpose. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of 38,000 square feet properties around and there are many developers that would love to put up luxury studio apartments, 28 of them on those properties, essentially student dorms. And so um, I perf I'm perfectly satisfied that this should go ahead and I'm looking forward to being a good neighbor to the project. Um, but I would like to have the ZBE just signal that this waiver, that one, what is it? Article six, table three, footnote M is much more significant uh, than uh, this height of the lamp standards or other things. Um, but I appreciate all the work that's been done and the very great patience shown by Laura Baker and her colleagues. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the project going ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. Um, KS. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. I am an Amherst resident and I live on Dana Street. And I would also like to thank the zoning board for very carefully considering this proposed development. Um, I agree with Elisa and I support uh, this override that will allow the increased density of housing and the creation of these subsidized housing units to serve community needs. I would like to ask the board whether or not they're planning to consider a condition that would secure in writing the resident service coordinator position and the number of hours um, currently planned, I believe at about 30 hours for the development. Through this process, we heard town staff, including John Hornick and several others, as well as Valley CDC themselves, speak at length about the importance of this position for the success of the development. And given the importance of these supportive services, they really should be pinned down in writing. Uh, this is the only way to protect them and ensure that the support really happens given the potential budgetary pressures that this development will face and that the board has previously discussed. So my question for the board is, is securing the supportive services definitely going to come forward as a condition by consideration from the board? Uh, I guess I'm, maybe it's the wrong timing in the process, but I'm a little surprised that board members haven't been mentioning this when it seems to be such an important part of the, the mission of this development. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the, the details of landscape and architecture and the size of the signs. And I hope that these very supportive services are also going to be um, remembered and recognized, and I hope that the board will ensure that they are uh, secured. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Anybody else wishing to speak? Okay. Um, we'll close off public comments. Uh, we'll move back to the board. 
Um, the next item on the agenda is my admonition to everybody to uh, think of lists of quest requests and uh, conditions for this property in the future. We've talked about them, um, and we'll and either if you have you have them now that you wish to, wish to wish to mention, we'll put them on a list so that we, they can be considered when we start considering the conditions. Uh, if otherwise, please um, talk to staff, let them know about uh, what conditions you are interested in, and the goal would be to start taking those up next week. Mr. Langsdale. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, I think normally after public comment, uh, if there are any questions or concerns that the uh, applicant then is right. able to uh, respond to them. So I think we should do that. Yep, you're right, it's normally the case. Um, I would love to comment. I am so appreciative of the comments that we've been getting, particularly from neighbors who we've been talking to and working with for several years now. Um, so I'm really impressed um, with the comments people have made tonight. Uh, the condition around uh, the, the resident service coordinator, I think um, we've we've projected a, a range ranging from 27 and a half to 30 hours. Um, we'd like to have some level of flexibility. I understand where the question's coming from. So I just think it's a negotiated point. Um, if that's something that the board um, wants to add as a condition, um, we'd be, you know, you know, looking for flexibility if the number of hours dips below you know 25 that that's a red flag or we would have to come back to the board to kind of renegotiate it if there were a significant change in the hours um because we're going to manage the property for a long time so there's some benefits with being prescriptive but also you know we need to do be have flexibility at the same time so it's it's just that balance that's all i would say on that My only response is I know that that's an item of concern from members of the board, and I think it's likely to see some kind of a condition proposed um, dealing with that at the uh, next meeting. All right. Um, so if people do have conditions uh, that they, or ideas of conditions, please let Maureen know, and we can discuss them when we start going through the conditions next. Other than that, um, I think it's, uh, it's a little after eight. Uh, we've heard from public comment. We have no other items on the agenda for tonight, um, except for um, public comment on items that, on anything that's not before the board tonight. We always have the um, required by town to open up the um, meeting to public comment on items that are not before the board. So at this point, I'd like to do that. So if anybody wishes to comment on something other than the uh, 132 Northampton, this is the time when you have three minutes to do so. Maureen. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, I feel that you need to make a motion to continue this public hearing until... So the next, I was going to do that after, yes, I guess I should have done that before we moved to public comment. Um, I will do that. Um, so I move we continue public hearing on this matter until the 15th of October at six o'clock. Is there a second? Seconded. Any discussion, any discussion on the motion to continue the hearing to six o'clock on October 15th? If not, it's a roll call vote. Um, I vote aye, Mr. Langsdale. Aye. Ms. O'Meara. Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. All right. The last item on the agenda is the opportunity for public comment on any, any matter not, not the subject of this hearing. That is not on 132 Northampton. So is there anybody who wishes to make a comment? Maureen, I see no one up there on the board that is asking to speak. So we'll close off public comment. Um, I have nothing else that have not been of any other new business on the agenda. 
And so I suspect this is time to move to adjourn this meeting. Um, so I move that we adjourn the meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. Is there a second? I hear a second from Mr. Maxfield. Is there any discussion about the motion to adjourn? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. All in favor of the motion respond to the roll call. I vote aye. Ms. Mr. Langsdale? Aye. Ms. O'Meara? Aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for all your work and your time tonight.